morning. I'm just excited about all those folks that gave their lives to Christ and have been publicly declared their faith in Jesus Christ this morning. We thank God for the baptism of four more. Praise God. Praise God. And, and I get just amazed because every time we baptize, look like this, the, the statistics or the percentage of men keep increasing. I'm like, what are y'all doing? And, and I get excited because when we get it together, everybody else seems to get it together. When we off, it kind of sets everybody else off. And so thank God for somebody's son, somebody's husband, somebody's future husband, somebody's uncle, somebody's nephew, and the wonderful work he's doing here in this house. Amen. Praise God. Well, you might have remembered the movie, mm, The Pink Panther. <laughs> and back the original version, you know, with Jack Clouseau in, uh, records, <laughs> the black and white version, records Clouseau going into a hotel lobby, and there is a clerk at the desk, and, you know, he asks for a room and all this kind of stuff. And then noticing a dog... <clears throat> he asked the hotel clerk a question. He said, does your dog bite? The clerk said, no. So, you know, Clouseau, he, he's kind of half-witted, you know, he ain't got it all together. So he goes over to the dog and stoops down and goes to pet the dog, nice dog, nice dog, and the, the dog nearly bit his hand off. He turned back around to the clerk and said, I thought you said, when I asked, I thought you said that the dog, your dog doesn't bite. He says, that's not my dog. <laughs> and, see, <clears throat> and see, sometimes we're not getting the right answers because we're asking all the wrong questions. And I want to kind of talk to you just a bit about that this morning because uh, you're going to find out something in, in just a moment. If, if, it, the, the questions that we ask determine the answers that we get. I remember when I was in, in my master's degree program, this is like 20 years ago, and um, there's a gentleman, he was coming across the United States, different venues, and he was from Australia. He was a multimillionaire. His name was Peter Daniels. He's, he's still alive, and um, I think he's worth about 23 million today. But anyway, when he was coming through, he was trying to show people how to, how to make money. And so I don't even know how I got connected with them, but I had some kind of project that I had to do, and I needed to, to interview people, someone, three people of his stature. I said, this is going to be fun trying to find somebody. And um, I was able to connect with them, and I was able, when he was back home in Australia, we had this call, and he said, he said, well, after he answered some of the things for the assignment, he said, well, I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask me three questions. And after, if you don't ask the right questions, the call will be complete. I said, my God. So I didn't know what to ask him. He said, go ahead, the clock is ticking. I said, well, uh, how'd you make your money? Wrong question. I said, okay, you got two more. I said, well, what's the, I said, um, let's see. How can you show me how to make money? He said, no, that ain't it either. Y'all, I asked the third question, don't remember what it is, and it was not it, and guess what? The call was over. <laughs> because in his mind, I asked the wrong questions. But I want to tell you that there's power in asking the right questions. There's power in asking the right questions. As a matter of fact, when you think about the idea of questions in the Bible, we often think about the statements that are made, but we often overlook the questions that are asked. Now, there are, there are many questions in Scripture that were asked, and some of them you would have known. They are more common than others, such as some of these simply when Cain uh, asked back to God, am I my brother's keeper? You know, or when God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? We remember that question. Or when Job asked, if a man dies, shall he what? Live again. We, we, we know that question. Or when God uh, when Moses asked God when he's going back to deliver the children of e Egypt, he said, Israel, he says, out of Egypt, he says, who shall I say sent to me? We, we know some of those questions. And, and then we know when Nicodemus asked Jesus a question, how can a man be born if he is old? And then we know Romans talks about what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And one of my favorite questions is, what shall be able to separate us from the love of God that, are in, that is in Christ Jesus. 
questions, questions, questions. Well, Jesus' life was surrounded with questions. It was questions all around his life, questions such as who your real daddy is. <laughs> we know what Mary been saying, but the word on the street is, well, <clears throat> questions. But, but there's one question that was asked of Jesus multiple times from the beginning of his life to the last week of his life. And the question simply is, who is this? When Jesus forgave the man's sins, who is this that forgives a man's sins? When Jesus spoke to the winds and waves, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? When the rulers would see his many miracles and wonderful works that he did, they would ask the simple question, who is this? Oftentimes the crowds would say, is this the son of David, the one that's prophesied to come, the Messiah? Is this the son of David? In other words, they were asking, who is this? When Jesus said, before Abraham was, and he used God's name, I am. They said, who is this? In their mind, he was blaspheming, claiming to be God. The Bible records about 3,000 questions that were asked between Genesis and Revelations. But if you answered every question that I named so far that we talked about in Scripture that we know that are common, it could do something to help you. But the one question that will change your life that is destiny defining is the very same question that they asked up until the last week, even Palm Sunday in his life. And the simple question is, who is this? And I want to talk to you just a minute about that question. Who is this and why it matters to you? When I talked to Peter Daniels, he, I had three questions. He assumed, and he was right, that it mattered to me because it might have meant to me I might get some money. He was right. I got the question wrong. But I'm glad I didn't get this question wrong because this question is destiny defining. I'm going to go someplace for Palm Sunday that I didn't see coming before the last week, which is the Old Testament. I'm going to go to Psalm 24 that was written by David, who is an ancestor to Jesus. And I want to show you how David answers the question, who is this, in three ways. And then I want to show you how that connects to Palm Sunday and what that means for your life. Are you ready this morning? Yes, I'm just going to teach this morning, just going to teach. Well, thank you. Y'all ready? Psalm 24. Here we go. The earth is the Lord's in all of its fullness or the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. <clears throat> For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Selah. Pause. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. They must have got a little sneak peek at my sermon this morning. Where the praise team at? <laughs> Talking about king of glory today. Uh -huh. <laughs> Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty. Anybody know him to be that kind of a God? I've been through some battles, y'all. I can tell you he's mighty in battle. Mm. Oh, my God. Come on. Lift up your heads, O you gate. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And in case you missed the first time he asked, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Yeah, yeah. And so the question is asked again, who is this? Psalm 24, 
rightfully placed after Psalm 23, which is rightfully placed after Psalm 22. Psalm 22, David, again, knowing that the Messiah would one day come through his line, knowing that a king was going to come that was greater than himself. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, records in Psalm 22 about the Messiah's body being pulled apart and describes perfectly a crucifixion before the Romans invented it. It's pretty powerful. Crucifixion will become the state order of execution like our electric chair. It's not a, a big deal that Jesus was crucified in a sense that many people were crucified. The big deal is that who he was when he was crucified. He wasn't the only one to be crucified. You go to Psalm 23 after that, and so we see in Psalm 22 that he would suffer. We see in Psalm 23 that he would be our shepherd. And that's how come he can lead you and guide you on a day to day. That's how come you can say he walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me that I'm his own. Because he's my shepherd. He got me. Tell you never say he got you. But in Psalm, the 24th Psalm, the vision of Psalms, he's writing this particular Psalm after what all the commentaries believe is when the Ark of the Covenant returns to Jerusalem. Now, you might remember the Ark of the Covenant when Israel crossed over the Jordan and the water opened up and they were able to cross over. Y'all follow that one? And the Ark went before them because the Ark represented God's presence amongst his people. You might remember the Ark when Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho with Israel for seven days, once a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day, and the walls came crumbling down because the Ark of the Covenant was with his people. God was present with his people, and he was present with power. Say, with power. And so the commentary, the commentators believe that David penned this when the ark would, after it had been captured over time and, and never brought back to Jerusalem, that as it was coming into Jerusalem during David's lifetime, they understood it as God's presence returning to be amongst his people. And so they wanted to give a royal reception. Does that make sense so far? And he starts off by answering the question of, who is this? By saying, whoever the this is, is the one who owns the earth and the fullness thereof. Whoever the this is, is the one who founded the earth upon the seas. Whoever that this is, is the one that claims creation. He says that he is the creator, that before him, nothing existed that exists. But that in him, all things exist and find their sustenance. They're, they're, They're sustained through him and by his word. And so when, when David is saying that, that the Lord is essentially creator, What he's essentially saying is that he owns it all. Think about what you have in your life. Think about what you left back home. Think about what you drove to the car, to the church and the car you drove. And think about the people that you love. That he says that the earth is mine and the fullness thereof is mine. And everything that the earth produces is mine. It all belongs to me. And the reason why he says that it all belongs to him is because he created it. Now, there is a lot of discussion in the latter years, in the more recent centuries, but even in in recent times, a lot of discussion and a lot of debate about the idea of creationism. The idea of God taking nothing and making something out of it and being the creator of the heavens and the earth. And I want you to understand this morning that when you hear those debates 
it's really never around how God created the heavens and earth or how the universe was made, but it's really around who is in charge. Because essentially when people debate about how creation came to be, they don't really care about how it came to be. They really want to say that if God did not create it and if God is not our creator, he cannot be our king. See, if God didn't create the heavens and the earth, he has no right to be king over me and everything that belongs to me. But if he, in fact, did create the heavens and the earth, and if he, in fact, is the creator of the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof, then he owns everything, and everybody owes him their allegiance. So when you talk to people that do not believe that God created the heavens, please understand it's, it's less around how creation took place and more around who's going to be in charge. The word for that would be naturalism. Naturalism would suggest that everything that you should believe should only be things that you can observe. You believe it because you can observe it with your five senses, and that's why you should believe it. And I'm going to tell you that that's baloney. That's baloney. I'm going to tell you that naturalism has less to do with when people say they don't have, they don't have faith or that it's, it's not about, that it's about faith. It's not actually about faith. It is actually about me wanting to be in charge. Why would you say that, Pastor? Because, let me ask you a question. How many believe if I took this watch off, if I took my watch off now and I had a little small screwdriver and I took all the components out of it, it ain't trying to come off because y'all are watching. Okay, there we go. If I took all the components out of it and all the little screws and all the springs and the hands and all the nuts and the washers, the little ones and all of that, how many of you believe that if I took this apart and I stuck it inside of a Ziploc bag and I shook it up Out would come a watch that works. Mm. Okay, all right, so, okay, all right, so listen, let me, how many believe that if I took this apart to all of its smallest particles and put it in a Ziploc bag and left it for a million years, that a million years from now, a clock would start? It ain't going to happen. It takes more faith to believe that the order of the universe came from disorder, from something that does not exist to something that now exists and functions than it does to trust God. Because the issue is really not about creationism. The issue is about who's going to be king. Because if, if he's not our creator, then I don't have to submit to him as my king. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. See, see, see there's something about the, the idea that, that, that we are created in the image of God. When I see a Ford, I can tell a Ford because I know how Ford makes their car because every Ford is made somehow in the likeness of what they put out. And God says, if you ever wonder who's imaging and just look at you and look around at everybody around on earth, none of us look like the rest of creation. There's nothing else in lower creation. There's no animal. There's no fish. There's no whale. There's no monkey that has what you have. Because God said, I made you in my image. I made you after my likeness. And you carry a part of me inside of you. A part that the tree don't carry. A part that the bee don't carry. A part that the squirrel don't carry. A part that the shrimp don't carry. I put something in you that's just like me. And to deny it is never an act of just unbelief. It is an act of disobedience. You, you, you know, I was watching the news the other day, a couple weeks ago, and they had this story on there about squatters in a house in DeKalb County. And it made me think of a friend that just told me a story early this year. He said, yeah, I got a friend who they folks squatted in his house. He said, but he knew exactly what to do. I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I don't even know what he did, but he worked with snakes. 
And you know where this is going, right? I said, oh, I'm putting that right here just in case. Tuck that one. He showed up as pest control. He serviced the property. It wasn't a few hours that the property was no longer being squatted. See, there's a lot of folks squatting in God's property. And there's coming a day where he will give an eviction. Because all around us there are signs that he exists. All around it, you can see the order of the universe, he exists. You can see that you're made in his image, he exists. You can see the evidence of God throughout nature. You can look at the human body and know that God exists. You can look at how a woman goes through pregnancy and know that God exists. Come on, somebody. You can look at DNA and know that God exists. You can look at the, 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 the detail on the human eye and know that God exists. We are made in his image. As a matter of fact, Colossians 1.16 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Why? Because the Lord is our creator. That's what David starts us off with. He said, if you want to know who is this, the Lord is our creator. And if he is our creator, he's deserving of our allegiance. Yeah, yeah. They're going to put that up on the screen. Come on. There we go. If, if he is our creator, he's deserving of our allegiance. This is why when Jesus walked the earth, Jesus could speak to the winds and the waves would obey him. He could speak to the demons and the demons would obey him. Whatever he did, because why? He's the Lord, our creator. This is why he didn't sink with gravity underwater. He could walk on water because he created gravity. Come on somebody. This is why he can multiply bread and fish because he's the creator and the sustainer of all things. This is why folks who never saw had sight after he laid hands on him. Why? He created the human eye. This is why he can raise Lazarus up out of off the deathbed after four days. Why? He created Lazarus. And that's why he can speak to the storms in your life and cause peace to be still. That's why he can speak to the confusion in your life and cause peace to be still. That's why he can speak to sickness in your life and cause healing to flow through your body. This is why he can speak to your family and cause reconciliation. This is why he can speak to your mind and bring a sense of calm because he's the creator and sustainer of all things. And we owe him our allegiance. Who is this? David starts off by answering, he's the creator. And because he's creator, he's deserving of our allegiance. But then the next question comes if that's pretty powerful. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah. The, that's a lot of power. I don't even know if I, if I can go near that kind of power. As a matter of fact, David asked a question, but who shall ascend? to his throne, to his hill. Who can, who can get to the hill of the Lord, to his holy place? Who, who is able to go in? And, and I want you to understand, in David's day, he's likely referring to the temple. The temple sat up, sat up high. The Ark of the Covenant would have been there. Who has the right to even go approach his throne? What man can climb up there and approach his throne? Who is worthy to approach his throne? And, and, and he, he answers the question. He says, the one that has clean hands and a pure heart. Innocent hands. You haven't used your hands to do any evil. Mm. The list is getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> so you're like, my hands been clean. I sanitize. They clean. Let's go a little deeper, Don. Let's go a little deeper. Well, not just innocent hands, but integrity of heart. That's the part that no one can see on the outside. 
But I can see the inside and the heart. And David says, the one that can get to his presence are the ones with clean hands and a pure heart and innocent hands and integrity of heart. And, 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 and then he goes on to say, the one that has not lifted up his soul to an idol. The list is getting shorter and shorter. You have not lifted, you have not lived to an idol. That means you ain't lived for a job. You ain't lived for that, that, that logo on your car. You ain't lived for, for all the things that the world thinks are important. You have not lifted up your soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully to your neighbor. That means that you have acted righteously in your relationships. Man, I ain't going to make it. But it does make it sound like that I could have if I had tried a little harder. It does sound like, man, if I had just not done this with, with my hands when I, you know, when, when I wanted to slap somebody, if I hadn't slapped them, I, I might have made it. If I hadn't cursed somebody in my heart, I might have made it. If I hadn't treated my significant other the wrong way, I, maybe I would have made it. I don't know. Maybe there was a chance. So it sounds like that I can approach his throne if I dot my eyes and if I cross my T's. It sounds like I would be vindicated if I do the right thing 365 days a year and 24 hours a day and seven days a week. It sounds like I can make myself clean and that I can find righteousness by what I do. And David said, yeah, but you need to keep reading just a little further. He says, no, no, that's not how it works. He says, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So what David is saying is, whoever this person is, he's the one that's not only creator, but he's also the giver of salvation. He is the one that makes you righteous. He is the Savior dedicated to our salvation. Because what he wants you to understand is that there's nothing you could do to make yourself righteous. There's nothing you could do to earn a spot in the kingdom. There's nothing you could do to ever make you worthy enough to be in his presence. He says, but what I will, I will do, I will become your salvation. I will become your righteousness. See, the issue that the Jewish people had when you fast forward a thousand years when Jesus arrives on the scene, the issue that the Jewish people had is that they were only looking for a king. They were not looking for a savior. And Jesus said, if I had done what you wanted me to do, you would have had earthly success, but you would have been eternally lost. So what I chose to do is not just to be an earthly king, I chose to be an eternal king that will give you salvation and build my kingdom in your heart. Because I am dedicated to your salvation. Now, I have some folks that have been dedicated to, in my life to my education. Say, you can do it. Go to college. You have what it takes. You can make it. I want to quit. Keep on going. I've had people dedicated to our ministry. Pastor, we receive the word that you give. Thank you for what you do. But there's only one person that I know from beginning to end before I got here that's been dedicated to my salvation, and it's Jesus Christ, my Savior. And he's dedicated to your salvation, and your salvation, and your salvation, and your salvation. And your salvation. And your salvation. And that's the reason why when they said, if you are the son of God, come off that cross. He loves you too much to come down. He loves you too much not to stay on the cross. He loves you too much not to go all the way through it. Hey. He is dedicated to our salvation. When there wasn't enough gold in heaven to pay our debt. When there wasn't enough walls of Jasper to pay our debt. When heaven didn't have enough pearls, he said, I'll pay the price of redemption. I'll give my life because I'm dedicated to your salvation. And while creation shows God's power, the Lord is our savior and our salvation shows his agenda. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He is the Lord, our Savior, 
dedicated to our salvation. Dedicated. Dedicated. Trust me, if anybody misses heaven, it will not be for any short that God did. He has done it everything possible that no man would be left. Thank you. Or lost. Woo, Jesus. Mm. My God. So who is this? It's the Lord, our creator, who deserves our allegiance. Why am I here this morning? Because Jesus deserves my allegiance. If I miss every other appointment this week, Jesus deserves my allegiance. That's why I'm here. Why are you still serving after decades? Because Jesus deserves my allegiance. You had friends that walked away, but Jesus deserves my allegiance. It's not always easy, but Jesus deserves my allegiance. Why do you have a heart for the lost? Because if Jesus is this dedicated for my salvation, I need to join him in his agenda for the salvation of the lost. Why does it matter if I do fulfill my mission? Because Jesus is dedicated to the salvation of the lost. That's why it matters. That means your sons, your daughters, your mother, your father, your uncles, your aunts, your nephews, your nieces, your coworkers, your neighbors, your enemies. All of them. And finally, when you get to the third part, of the psalm is actually a call and response. Now, a lot of the songs that African Americans sing, well, we sang, we don't sing quite as much, but how many of you remember testimony service, devotional service? How many of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about? <laughs> Google it. <laughs> what do we do? I get joy when I think about. You got it. <laughs> That actually came from Africa, believe it or not. We didn't invent it here. It came with us. <laughs> but the Levites would get together. Because, you know, Psalms are also songs. And they would sing. And there was a call and response. But before I break that down, I just want to show you a quick illustration of, so you can understand what's about to happen at the last part of the scripture. In more recent history, when the king of England would be on his chariot, and approach the city, and you know, the cities are gated and walled. That's why even today you have Wall Street. All of those cities back in the day had walls around them to protect them, right? And so when the king would come, they would, the herald would go outside, and he would holler, open the gate! And then they would hear a voice on the other, from the other side inside the city, inside the gates, and the simple, voice, the simple cry back would be, who's there? And then from the outside, the herald would yell back, it is the king of England. And the gates would open, and the king and his processional would then proceed into the city, and they would be received with a royal welcome. Can you picture it? Okay, so let's go back now to when David wrote this. During his time, there was also a herald that would go. And it sounded like this. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, and the king of glory may come in. And on the inside of the gates, it sounded like this before they would raise the door. They would say, who is the king of glory? And on the opposite side of the hill, we yell back, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And when that exchange happened and they verified who was opening it up, they opened up the gates and received the king of glory. Now, what does this have to do with Palm Sunday? That's a good question. Y'all want to know? Y'all nosy. <laughs> what does this have? Well, I'm glad you asked that because who knew 
But David wrote that a thousand years before. And all of his, after, after that for generations and centuries, the Jewish people would read Psalm 24 every Sunday, not Saturday on the Sabbath, but every Sunday. So, Palm Sunday was a Sunday, right? And Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, and he has people laying down their coats and cloaks and grabbing palm leaves and laying it down to create a royal entrance. And when all of these people come in, because remember, it, wasn't, it was not long before, we're talking days before, that Lazarus was raised from the dead. So all these people are joining in the procession, but as they get closer to the city, folks are saying, well, who is this? Who is this? As a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and read exactly what it says. It says right here in uh, Psalm, uh, rather Matthew 21, it says, I'm going to read from verse 9, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. By the way, estimates that there were 200,000 in Jerusalem during the Passover. And asked, who is this? What did they ask? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So while Jesus is, I want you to picture Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. And for, who is this? Who is this? This is Jesus, the prophet from Galilee. While that's happening up in the temple, the Levites are reading the 24th Psalm. And who is the king of glory? The Lord God, strong and mighty. The Lord God, mighty and balanced. He is the king of, and so I have to say, who is this? The king of glory. Who is this? The king of glory. Who is this? Let's practice. Who is this? No, y'all got your lines mixed up. Who is this? Who is this? King of glory. Who is this? King of glory. And in one way, they were both right. It was Jesus, and it was the Lord God, mighty, the king of glory. Entering in amongst his people. And Jesus not only fulfills it here, but he also fulfills it when he ascends back into heaven and heaven's gates are open and the king of glory enters in and is seated next to his father. And the other way he fulfills it is every time a heart opens up and asks Jesus to come in as Lord, to be the king over their life. This is also fulfilled. Because the issue is never that Jesus is not pleased to come dwell with us. The issue is, will we open up the door? It's never that he won't come. It's only that we may not, we may not open up the door. How many have opened up that door to Jesus? Oh, my God. We're just standing on your feet this morning. Y'all can come up. He is pleased to dwell. 